What's going on, everybody? You're tuned into another episode of the Music Mastery Podcast with your host, Lizzy the Gifted, where I do a brand new episode every single day, documenting my journey as an independent musician. Really pumped about today's guest. Really pumped about today's guest. Um, you know, for those of you who are singer songwriters or musicians and music producers, but mostly singer songwriters and musicians, this is absolutely going to be your episode. I've got a very special expert on song structure arrangement and songwriting in general um we've got dano the host of rule your sound on youtube or on instagram dano lady be good dano what is going on thank you for joining me on the podcast thank you so much for having me i am so excited to be here and um, excited to be a part of your podcast um it's it's you know a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with you yeah so, you know, for those of you who, you know, have not heard of Dano because you live under a rock, I'll kind of give you a little background, but <laughs> rule, rule Your Sound on YouTube uh, is Dano's YouTube channel. And, you know, essentially you're breaking down famous songs, but not just, I mean, I've watched a lot of your videos. Very easy to binge, in my opinion, you know, as somebody who creates songs, because you're talking song structure, you're talking the rhythm of the lyrics, like the verses, like this, like there's every, every, every element. I'm curious as to, you know, how did you come up with the idea for, for these videos? Sure. So, um, the, I can't really answer that in a short answer. So, but I'm <laughs> going to try to condense it. So, um, I do not come from a popular music background. I actually come from a, a classical music background and, um, I was trained in classical, uh, for a long time and then decided after getting accepted to college for music ed and deciding that I hate classical music and it's not for me and dropping out of school. <laughs> um, I decided that I wanted to make the switch to contemporary music and, and pop music. That's what I listened to. That's what I enjoyed. Um, well, I really struggled with that transition because I realized I don't know how to write pop music. I don't know how to write contemporary music. And um, I literally took like a five or six year break from music altogether. I was like, well, I guess it's not for me. I can't do it. And so I had a second wind um, kind of recently, maybe like two years ago. And what I had to do to teach myself um, what it is that makes these pop songs good was I had to study them myself. So um, even though I'm someone who had loved music my whole life, uh, I was listening to music in a much different way now, where instead of just putting it on and like cleaning the house or driving my car or whatever, um, I would sit there with a notebook and I would listen and everything cool that I liked about that song, I wrote down just to start building out like that library of ideas so that when I go to sit at my piano and I try to figure out what I'm going to write, I have some... Um, like examples of what other people have done, artists that I am inspired by and want to emulate um, so that, you know, I know what to do when I sit down at the piano. And so that's how it started. Um, I just listen to music and I write down all the things I think that are cool about it. And um, it was really amazing because I was discovering so much about these songs, songs that I have heard before. Um, and you're hearing them in like a new way. And I found it absolutely fascinating. You know, if you have a song that you've listened to a hundred times, but you never listen to the baseline, and then you take the time to listen to the baseline, you're like, oh my gosh, this is a completely different song. There's so much more like depth to it. I can't believe I didn't notice this. I didn't notice what they were doing. And um, I was so excited and fascinated by it. I was like, you know, I think other people would be excited um, to hear this too. So, uh, and you know, if other people are looking to improve their own songwriting, I'm already doing the homework by, <laughs> by doing the research and listening and, you know, writing out all the things that are super cool about it. So why not, um, share that with uh, other songwriters and see if it'll be helpful for them as well. Yeah. And I mean, like you've definitely done the homework, like as I'm watching your videos, it's, it's, it's kind of weird because it's very like educational, but there is this sense of entertainment. I don't know if you mean to do that, but I'm personally entertained because I'm like, oh, wow. Like it's just so, to me, it's so interesting. Um, you know, I think that I, I'm wondering, like, do you enjoy making those videos or is there a sense of difficulty? Cause they're, 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 they're not just, I mean, they're obviously you're filming them and it's just, it, it is just you talking, but there's like, 
there's a lot like you'll you'll have like graphics will pop up on the side and then you'll play the song but then like like the one you just recently did um with that song why are you always in the mood like you'll uh-huh. have your full <laughs> screen will like you'll i don't know you're obviously doing a lot post production it's not just you talking like are these what's the process like for actually making the videos for you so um first of all i love making the videos i'm so fascinated by the content so that absolutely helps um all the time that goes into this i knew when i started my, my channel that it was going to be a lot of work um but even knowing that i think i underestimated it a little bit it probably takes me about four hours or so to make a video um so what i'll do is i'll script the video first uh then i record it um and then after that i uh i stitch it together I actually do the audio separately um, in Logic to have better audio. And that way I can like clip in actual parts of the song to give examples so that people can hear what I'm talking about instead of just talking about it. Um, And then I stitch that all together in iMovie. And then I go to Canva. I don't know if you've heard of Canva. It's like a a website that helps. Yeah. (laughs) Like I feel like all all musicians use it for their marketing. It's so uh, user friendly, but I do Canva for all of the graphics and, uh, I, I honestly wish I could do more graphics than I do, um, but it's a, it's a huge lear- learning curve for me because I have very little experience doing video production or anything like that. But um, yeah, so that that's pretty much how I stitch it together. And um, and yeah, all said and done, probably about four hours for video. How, how often are you putting videos out? Right now I'm doing them once a week. I did take off this week because it's Christmas um, sure. and lots of stuff going on, but uh, I am committed to once a week and I've been toying with the idea of doing twice a week in 2021. Um, I do have a full-time job in addition to this, so I'm not hundred percent sure I can make that time commitment, but I really would love to. So if it's not two videos every single week, uh, I'm going to absolutely try uh, to, to have some more videos and content on there. I mean, even once a week is great. Like I'm happy to hear you're doing one once a week. Cause I can, I mean, just from watching the videos, See, you're in a position, in my opinion, that I think once a week's perfect because the videos have a lot of value. Like, um, meaning like I'm watching your video, I'll watch one video and I'm literally like, fuck, like I want to go in the studio right now, make a song, you know, and start just kind of having like, after watching your videos, what I get out of it is I want to be more scientific a little uh, cause usually I'm fuck, like, usually I, I just go freestyle, you know, like I literally go in there and I'll be like, all right, let's bang on the piano. Like, <laughs> blah, 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 and let's just go. Um, and I think, I think that's cool. Like it's a fun thing for me, but like, I'm thinking, well, like if I really want to make like a great song, like maybe there should be a formula watching your videos makes me realize, I don't know, maybe it'd be kind of fun to do it. And I'm saying all this, it's long winded, but I'm saying this to say that your videos have so much value that I think once a week's fine. I mean, twice a week would be even better for me as a viewer, but I think you're okay with once a week because the videos are super fucking valuable. Um, so I'm, I'm curious as to what is your, do you have like a goal of what you want to end up doing with this direction of teaching people, teaching people this material? Do you have like a, a kind of an end goal or a bigger goal? Yeah, um, I, this this might sound uh, funny or, or weird or whatnot, but honestly, the reason I'm doing this is mostly to hold myself accountable to continue to do the homework and research myself so that I can become a better songwriter myself. And um, I'm really hoping to apply everything that I'm learning by putting these videos together um, into an EP that, that hopefully I'll release some singles next year and then have the full EP um, in early 2022. So... The end goal really is for me to be able to make an EP that I can say that I'm proud of and um, that is my best work, uh, you know, that, I, that I've ever done. So that's really my end goal. And as I said, just, just putting them together is, is, and making it public is uh, my way of holding myself accountable. So I actually do the work uh, to study and learn. Gotcha. Very cool. Love that. Well, I'm excited to hear the EP when it comes out. I'll definitely check it out. Thanks. Um, so, okay. Let's get into the trenches of the music itself. I'm so curious about, sure. like, you know, obviously you have a lot of songs. Um, you know, you have a lot of songs that you've featured. You have a lot. Actually, you're not even just talking about specific songs. Like, you'll have, like, 10 Ways to Start a Song. 
You know, you have yeah. different mm -hmm. other videos as well. Um, well, actually, you know, I'll just ask you this. What, what do you think are some of the things that, uh, let's talk mistakes first. What are some hmm. mistakes that you feel a lot of musicians make when it comes to making music? I think the biggest mistake is that people are not being conscious or strategic about their sound. And, and you kind of mentioned this earlier, like freestyling or what, whatnot. That is amazing. And that is really valuable to be able to do as an artist. And what a great way to start. So you freestyle, you just let the music pour out from your heart, you write it down on paper, but then don't stop there. Don't let that be the finished product. Look at this and say, all right, you know, at this line, I really want, at this line, I want the listener to like, be like, Ugh, oof, you know, like if you're hitting a point home. So then it's like, how can I enhance this one section to make sure that 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 listener feels the way I'm feeling at this part in the song? Or, you know, um, this song that, that, that I wrote from my heart and just poured out is really great, but you know, it is a little repetitive. <laughs> so um, how can I make sure that this is going to be a song that someone isn't going to turn off halfway through because it, fe it feels repetitive? So I think that the most important thing is to be conscious um, about the decisions you're making. And you know what? Maybe the song that comes out of your heart or whatever, you're intending for it to be really emotional and unsettling. But what comes out is something that feels a little more like, I don't know, happy or upbeat. So then you can look at that and say, all right, this is close. It's really good, but it's not really conveying the emotions that I'm trying to convey if I look at it objectively, which is a whole nother thing. I think artists have a hard time um, being able to, to look objectively and critically at their own songs, and I'm certainly guilty of it. Um, but yeah. by taking the time to do that, you really can uh, help your song convey the emotional response out of your listener that you're trying to get them to feel. Right. And I, I would, I mean, we could go on and on about different things that musicians have trouble with. You know, for me personally, one of them is <clears throat> the idea of, I mean, honestly, for me, and tell me what, you, what your experience has been. One of the things that stops me so much is feeling like my music isn't going anywhere. Like feeling like I have to work another job or whatever that I really don't want to do uh, or, or just living the life I don't really want to live. And that gets into the music for me you know mm -hmm. and that's when I get to the point where I'm like just use music for fun you know don't have a formula to it but I also feel like I also want to make the best music possible and I, I honestly feel like if I were to take some of the tips from your channel and actually did them like I probably would make better music anyway but can you talk about kind of what's your experience been with just like you know maybe some of the challenges you personally have gone through with music yeah, I mean, everything you just said are, are challenges that I have personally gone through. Um, you know, I am not making money with music right now, but I would love to. That is the end goal. Um, yeah. I would love to quit my nine to five. And yeah, there is a balance between having it solely be for fun <laughs> um, and then, you know, thinking of it from more of like a business perspective. But I would say from the creation part, from the music creation part, um, that really should be the most fun. And I right. think refining it by, by what I guess what I'm trying to say is we all find the part of like freestyling or, or having the music come out of our heart, you know, just putting that down as fun, but tweaking it to make it even better can all be a lot of fun. <laughs> I promise, you know, when you are working on a song and you and you make it and it just like hits you and you're like yes like that is amazing that whole process should be fun and then leave the not fun part to the you know the marketing and the business end and all that stuff you know the stuff that you have to do in order to make it um and to be successful but try to find joy in taking that song from its first draft to the finished product and um you know i think that it's it's frustrating, it's challenging, but that makes the reward of actually getting it done so much better. Right. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, how has your process changed over the years with like making music? I think th the biggest way my process has changed is, um, number one, I realize that not everything I write is gonna be good. 
And that is, that was hard because it was like, at first, like if I took the time to write a song, like it has to be on the EP or it has to be performed. (laughs) But no, like you need to practice writing songs. So I've written a ton of songs that are garbage and, you know, I play them a few times. Maybe I'll record them in Logic real quick and, you know, then put them in a folder. And I practiced writing a song. That's a purpose in and of itself. So, so the first thing I would say is not everything that you're going to write, um, you know, is going to be gold. Um, but then other than that, I would also say when you write a song, don't consider it done when you finish writing the last lyric or writing the last, you know, melody or chord progression. It's not done. That is your very first draft. And so that is not close to the end. That is very close to the beginning because Mm -hmm. you can take that song and, and do so much with it in the production, um, in the pre-pro in the production, um, that it can be a completely different song by the end of it. So when you spew whatever you want down, um, and you, and you quote unquote, finish the song, just know that you're still very much in the beginning. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I do not practice it enough. Like I, 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 (laughs) I know I myself, like where my challenge comes in is because like I, I produce my music. Do you, do you do that too? Um, I do produce my own demos. Uh, but when I record my EP, I will hire a producer. Got it. Okay. Interesting. Oh, very interesting. Cool. Uh, okay, cool. That just, that just blew my brain too. Like I never really, okay. Well, all right. Like that just blew me away because that just was like, Oh shit. Why am I not doing that? Like, why am I not, you know, cause I, I fully produce my own music. But like, I could ask a couple homies to be like, yo, like producer homies, like, yo, come on through, throw some flavor on here or whatever. Definitely. Or, yeah. Like, why the fuck don't I do that? Huh? That's yeah. And if, if you look at like any of the, the top charting songs, most of them have more than one producer on it right. anyway. And they usually have like six songwriters too. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. So, so there's a lot of value in uh, collaborating and working with a team. Um, on these projects. And I think a big part of that reason also is um, we are so emotionally attached to our own music and our own creation. It is so hard sometimes to think objectively and critically about our own music. And, you know, I, I'm not an amazing producer by any means. um, But I have a friend uh, that asked me to produce a song for her. And it was such a different experience from my perspective because I'm producing a song for her in like record time (laughs) than what usually takes me. And uh, I'm like, why am I doing that? I'm like, oh, because I'm not like, I know that I want like a plucky sound here. So I go on Mm. and I find a plucky sound and it's done. Whereas if it's my own song, I'm like, I need to listen to every single plucky sound that Logic has to offer. And then I need to go on the internet and I need to like browse a whole bunch for like hours to find the perfect sound when really it doesn't matter. (laughs) Right, Or interesting. Yeah. Or, you know, you work with another producer that's just like, oh, I know the perfect sound for that. And it's done. So um, just working with a team is is just so incredibly valuable and helpful. And my husband is a musician too. So it's so amazing. Like I had one song that I was completely stuck on like for weeks. And I'm like, there's just something about this song that I don't like and I can't figure out what it is. And, um, you know, I'm playing it and he like walks by and he's like, why don't you change this chord to that? Bam, song was done. And I was like, that's it. <laughs> that, I can't believe I didn't think of that. I'm like stuck in this song for weeks and you just come here in two seconds and be like, change the chord. So I'm um, just having it, a, a fresh set of ears on your, on your stuff um, is so incredibly valuable. I agree with that one trillion percent. I mean, and it's like, that's been a big challenge for me too, because like, like I said, because I fully produce. And like the reason I even got into producing, like I used to just be a, a rapper, lyricist, whatever, vocalist, recording artist. And um, I just was like, Dude, I can't afford to put out music if I have to keep paying for beats and paying for mixing and mastering. Mm-hmm. I got to do it myself. And I heard Russ's story and I was like, well, this guy did it. I could do it. So, so I did. And it really took the element of a team out of it for me because I just was like, I just was like, I just want to stop depending on people. but. I lost out on what you just said, that fresh set of ears, like that fresh set of ideas to inject into your song. And that was, you know, something that I want to obviously incorporate more of now because I actually, I get it. Um, 
there's a producer I'm working with, the guy I was telling you about from New Jersey. He's like a songwriter too. So like I'm trying to work with him more and stuff like that. So um, do you, what, like, so are, right now, like, are you linked up with, like, what's, what's it been like for you in terms of building that kind of little community for yourself, for your music? Yeah, so um, honestly, when I go to find a producer, I will probably go on the website soundbetter.com, uh, which if you haven't heard of it is like literally changed my life. <laughs> it's um, basically a website where you can hire uh, uh, any type of studio musician um, or producers, mixing engineers, mastering engineers, um, and it's like all remote. And, uh, you know, for example, I was just working on a, a project. I'm, I'm doing a song. Um, a version of Auld Lang Syne and like I had logic strings and it just sucked and I'm just like I really want a real violinist so I found one on Sound Better that gave me in a day live violin parts um, like seven live violin parts for like $75 and um, you know so I'll probably find uh, a producer on there um, I really want to work with someone that has um, you know credits with uh, with major labels um, but with that said, <laughs> um, a great way that I've been building my network is through Instagram. And especially with the pandemic, um, not being able to really go anywhere or do anything fun for like an entire year. I have made so many really wonderful relationships with other musicians and songwriters and producers on Instagram. And I cannot say enough how incredibly valuable that has been. Um, just having that network of support um, if I have a question about literally just either ask it and get like really smart people to give me good responses or, you know, DM someone, um, like for example, when I was starting my YouTube channel, there's someone that, that was making great videos themselves and I didn't know anything about video production and, you know, he walked me through everything and now people right. are messaging me and asking me about my light setup, you know, so it's such a great community and I rely on that all the time, all the time. Mm hmm um now i'm even more screwed now i'm gonna be binging on sound better like i'm on soundbetter.com right now and i'm best. like what is going on here like i think i probably have come across this before but never really dove into as much as now that you're telling me about it and i'm yeah. like oh my god like if you're really serious about music you know and you you want to you want to make really great music this is it you know you spend it some sure and is. i say serious because you got to spend some money mm -hmm. but you're getting like you know, I'll give you an example. My biggest thing that I have trouble with is my top line melodies. You know, I'm not very oh. good at singing. Like I'm okay. No, nah, I'm actually not even okay. Like I'm not that good at singing. I know kind of my range. That's it. But I'm really not good at coming up with top line melodies. Um, here we go. Like I, I literally, there's like a whole category for that. Like I was going to say writing. that's one of the most popular categories. <laughs> right. And I've been, you know, I not, again, I'm not, 1000% serious about this one task, but like, I like would love to write more pop songs. You know, I tend to just like write whatever I'm feeling. It kind of tends to be very like hip hop rappy or like maybe like smooth R and B ish. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just kind of have my own little thing that I do, but I do want to make more like, Ooh, this could be a pop song. Like this could really be top 40. Cause I actually like that. Not because I want to try to sell out, but I just, I don't know. I just want to make something that feels good and be catchy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And this is it. I feel so, you 100%. Yeah. So you blew my mind. Now I've got, so, so basically from this one podcast episode, for all you singer songwriters, you owe me your whole career because I just gave you <laughs> the YouTube channel to go to rule your sound. And I just, we just found out the website to go to, to start hiring musicians that will probably make your song sound a lot better. Oh yeah. Wow. I'm so excited. Cool. <laughs> Let's keep, Oh my God. Like now, uh, like all I want to do is go on rule your sound and soundbetter.com, like make music all day today, but Yay. we'll save that <laughs> for the weekend. So anyway. Okay. So, um, well, you know, I'm going to jump gears a little. Sure. Um, you talked about, you have like this full-time job, right? How mm -hmm. do you balance your time between you've got a full-time job, you've got your YouTube channel and you're trying to make your own music. How do you organize your time? So um, I'm going to start by saying that I am a type A personality and over planner. And even 
being that type of person, it is really hard and it is a struggle. I usually wake up uh, every single morning at 6.30 or 7 to um, edit my YouTube videos before I have to go to work at 8.30. Um, I usually work through my lunch break so that I can leave a little bit earlier um, and hope that I'm not too burnt out to uh, do things after work. So um, mm. it is a lot, but I love it and it's fun. And um, it's it's so weird because, sorry, my cat is like- <laughs> Yes, I was like, yes, there's <laughs> an animal. The For those of you listening, the cat just came in. <laughs> Um, but, uh, it's, it's so weird to me because I always have had a hard time getting up in the morning. Um, but I don't mind when I know that the first thing I'm going to do is work on my YouTube channel because it's so much fun and I love right. it. So, um, I think that that's really important to like, if you are feeling burnt out for your music and you're struggling, like take a break and, um, figure out what you need to do to fall in love with it again, because you need that passion to be able to drive you to, to get all this stuff done. So hence, you know, I'm taking a, a week off now. I need to recharge <laughs> right. before I, I go back, uh, you know, into 2021, but yeah, it's, and you know, it's being a type A personality. It is very challenging and frustrating. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, when my Instagram isn't growing as fast as I want it to, or my YouTube watch time is not going as fast as I want it to, or I'm behind in my writing and I'm behind in, you know, some of the things that I owe uh, friends with projects I'm helping with them on. It is really stressful and overwhelming, but you got to keep your eye on the prize and you got to keep chugging along and mm -hmm. you got to hustle. <laughs> How long has your, when did you start your YouTube channel? Two months ago. It's brand new. Oh my God. That's yep. amazing. Wow. Brand I thought new. you were going to say like a year or two, three, four years. Nope. Nope. Two months ago. I started in, I think October 27th was my first video. Very cool. Well, so like, cause I was going to say like your YouTube channel, I mean, it's going to grow like the shit you're, you're doing everything right. I mean, you're doing everything right with, with it. You, your YouTube channel looks amazing. I mean, I think you're doing really good. I think if always, it's always good to learn new things about anything like with YouTube, you know, I think like just do what you do. And if you keep try to keep, maybe keep researching the keywords, blah, 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 all that stuff, Yes. Like, all those things, but you, you have great titles. Like, I mean, it has, I mean, I think, I don't know. I'm not an expert on SEO, but like, it seems like it's pretty good. Thanks. I do SEO research um, on all my videos, especially my latest. Maybe I didn't on like the first few that I posted. Um, but yeah, I do SEO research um, a lot. And uh, one of, this is kind of random but related, but one of my favorite quotes of literally all time, and that literally drives me every single day, is that in order to be successful, you don't need to be an expert. You need to be resourceful. And um, I could not agree with that more. And even when I put this YouTube channel, there are a million people that are, maybe not a million, but there are so many people that are successful on YouTube and they're willing to share how they did it for free on YouTube. So if you do your homework and you research it, um, pretty easily you can find out how to do SEO research, what keywords to post for, what tools um, you know can help. I use TubeBuddy to help me with my SEO. So like, all the information is out there and people are so generous and willing to share it. So as long as you know where to find it, um, you know, you kind of can get like a roadmap or help for not just YouTube growth, but literally any other topic on earth right. <laughs> that you want to learn about. Right. Well, I mean, and it's funny cause like even that, that same idea of like just needing to be willing to share and being resourceful is probably, I mean, that right there is going to help you with a lot. For example, I would have never found out about you if you weren't giving tips on songwriting. I might not have. I mean, because mm -hmm. I don't even, rem I think I, I honestly don't remember how I first found you. I, I'm sure it was on Instagram. I don't know. But because you were just like, yo, I'm just going to share tips on songwriting. You provided value to me. And I was like, oh, she's got a YouTube channel. And then I was like, oh, fuck, this is dope too. And now you're on my podcast and we're homies. And like, I'm going to definitely listen to your YouTube when it comes up, <laughs> right? And it's just, and it's like, you know, you just were like, I'm just going to share my thoughts on these things and go into great detail on song structure and things like that nature. 
Yeah. And, and literally when I was starting the YouTube channel, like the thing that was going through my head was like, this would be really valuable for all the people I'm friends with on Instagram because my Instagram mm. is full of songwriters, uh, independent songwriters and independent musicians. So I'm like, this content is going to provide so much more valuable than me just like, you know, I don't know, posting like poor quality covers. Cause I'm still working on, 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 you know, um, my EP and my original content. So I don't, I don't even have like that many good original songs to post. So I'm like, this is a great way for me to provide value to, um, you know, my followers and, and all the fellow independent artists in the community with me that are giving me value all the time. So it's nice and, to, be able and, to do a little bit. Yeah. For them. <laughs> yeah. And it's cool. Like, it's so funny. Like literally right before this podcast recorded, I was interviewing somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, and he's a producer who teaches basically like Instagram growth for mainly for producers. Literally anybody could take it. Um, oh, nice. His name's Jumpers, J-M-P-R-Z. And yeah, his program's called Producer Gram. So, but I was talking to him and I was like, what's your like big goal? And he's like, oh, like I want to do like Tomorrowland. Like I want to perform at that festival. And nice. I was like, oh, that's funny. Like, why are you doing this Producer Gram thing? Like that doesn't, it doesn't seem like it lines up. He's like, well, I just, I needed something to like get some income. And it just seems like both you, him, and even me, we're like all just trying to do our own original music. but we see these opportunities, like you're doing your YouTube, I'm doing the podcast, he's doing producer gram, where it's like, these are these like opportunities that get brought to the forefront that seem like they can get us results faster. And, it, yeah. and we also, but really we also, we, we, we want to be our own musicians. A hundred percent. Yeah. And I, I think that, um, this allowed me to doing the YouTube channel. Um, although, you know, it really came from me just wanting to learn and figured I might as well share. Um, you know, I would be lying if I didn't think about how it could help me grow as an artist as well, you know, because now I have a bigger audience so that when I release my EP, instead of releasing it to a thousand followers on Instagram, hopefully by then I'll have like over 5,000 followers or, you know, that's like five times the reach you would have gotten. And, sure. you know, these are people that know you um, and have been watching you grow for a year and, you know, feel like they're a part of that story. So um, there's no doubt that, that by doing this, that I guess I should say, I know that doing this will help me in the marketing of my EP um, when it eventually comes out. Right. I'm sure it will. I mean, content is the name of the game. I know that's one of the reasons I started the podcast was simply just, yeah, just documenting my journey. Like I'm not a fucking expert at it. I mean, I, I have things I know I know how to do and I'm good at, but I'm not an expert on marketing, on music. I just, I just document my own journey. Like that's literally it, you know? And you're, but you're, what I love about what you've done is you've niched it down pretty specifically of like, yeah, I'm going to teach, like we're going to talk song structure and we're going to give songwriting tips. Like it's. Yeah. It's really niche. It's really niche. It's good. And your growth is, I mean, it's going to be predicated on just continuing to make the best content you possibly can. Cause like you're literally doing mm -hmm. it. like you're making dope ass content. It looks good. It's branded super well. I mean, it's fire. Where do you, I'm, I'm curious about something. How do you come up with, um, which songs to analyze? Did I cut out? Sorry, my internet like cut out for a little bit. Oh, no, I'm repeating the question. Yeah, I was just curious. How do you come up with the songs you want to analyze? Oh, um, so first of all, I am selfish in that I'm only picking songs that I personally uh, would want to use as my own influence in, in my music. Cool. Um, and Not I really want to write. <laughs> and I, I want to write like a top 40 quality level song. So, so that's where I pick. Um, that from. So honestly, what I'll usually do is I listen to uh, the top artists on Spotify. And um, if I hear something when I'm listening to it, I'm like, oh, that's super dope. Uh, then I'll make a video on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Perfect. I mean, and the songs you're analyzing are pop songs. So it's not like they're like, you're the only one who likes them. Like they're very popular songs. Uh oh, you might be frozen here. Hold up. Because, I think, um, I think, oh, go ahead. You, you froze up for a sec. Say it again. Oh, sorry. 
Uh, oh, there we go. Um, I, uh, oh, and I was just going to say also, you know, a, a part of the reason why I am doing the popular songs is that is what people search on YouTube more. Um, so I do have some influences that are less popular, like Kay Flay, Janelle Monet, Melanie Martinez. But um, although I'm doing the homework for those on my own, I'm probably not going to make videos on them. Maybe I will. We'll see. But I do want to make sure that I'm, I'm doing videos that people are actually searching for on YouTube. That's probably, and that's the smart marketing move is to try to, that way your videos are more optimized for like SEO and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about something like now we'll switch. I kind of want, I know I'm switching gears back and forth. Like I just, I'm so curious as to, okay, let's say I'm like, all right, you know what? I've watched a lot of, um, you know, watched a lot of the videos. Like I want to do this myself. Like I want to try to do the homework myself. What do I listen? What do I look for first? What do I listen to first? What am I trying to listen for? Sure. I would say, um, the first thing you should do is spew out all your ideas on paper. Um, I don't know if I can curse on here, but you can say whatever um, you want. Okay. <laughs> I literally tell myself to just shit on the page <laughs> okay. and like Perfect. make, just don't worry about it sounding good. Just like get it out, get the music out and then go back to your song and every start from the beginning, every single part that you're like, mm, nah, don't just like frustrate and be like, this I'm gonna be like, why don't I like it? the chord progression is it the melody is it just not those questions are all vibe but i need to keep the energy going like this beat right. never changes throughout the whole song so since the problem is an energy problem well, I'm going to do things that can correct the energy. Maybe I need to cut out a beat so that there's some space so that all of a sudden the beat stops and then it comes back in again. That's a way to create energy and momentum. Right. Um, maybe you write a song and it's like, I'm just feeling like it's not catchy. Well, then look at the melody. What scale are you using? You know, for a pop song, they're all pentatonic. So um, right. are you using a lot of like fourth and seventh scale degrees that should be taken out? Like, look at that melody, then change it melodies are any of those catchier so um it's kind of like little by little piece by piece just asking yourself why don't i like this and then uh you know just like playing around with it um you know there, the thing about music is it's an art so there's not always like there's actually never one right answer if you're like i want to write a song that like is a ballad that gives people the feels and you're listening to it and you're just like, it's just not giving me the feels when I listen to it. Then right. be like, maybe I can change up my lyric structure because maybe all my lyrics are, you know, four syllables, four syllables, four syllables, four syllables. And even everything that's even with syllables and number of lines um, creates like stability. So if you want a feeling of unstability, you want your listener to be unsettled, do some odd number lines, do three lines instead of four. Instead of having four, 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 do like four three to you or something like that, you know, mess around with it, play around with it. I think that people are scared to like break or ruin their song. Um, but you know, just play, just play, just have fun. Um, try different things and, you know, wait until you find, wait until you're really happy without going overboard. There are some people that obsess over like the kick sound for like three weeks. Um, but you know, you know what I'm trying to say, I guess. Absolutely. And, and it's what's coming to mind while you're talking is, you know, I come from a background of, like I said, I was originally just the lyricist recording artist, right? I didn't even, I didn't know any music theory at all. And since then I've, you know, learned piano, music theory, producing, all that stuff. And I really like looked at the, like I looked at my career and I was like, wow, like I would not have made any strides if I didn't know anything about producing or music theory like if I just stuck with being a songwriter lyricist vocalist like I'd be screwed I wouldn't be able to put out music as much and all the like like you said a lot of stuff just now that was jargon 
that I totally understood everything you said, but like pentatonic, like people don't know what pentatonic, sevens, fourths, stuff like that, right? And I'm not gonna ask you to translate it. I'm just saying for those of you who listen and you don't know what that stuff is, like we can't sit here and explain every single word. Like you gotta be able to catch up. You need right. to be able to put in your due diligence and like learn stuff so that you know when we say, oh, everything's in pentatonic scale. Like to you and me, I'm like, yep. Like it's the same right. thing as saying like, what kind of coffee do you like? It's the same like familiarity. And if you don't know it and you just heard that and you're like, I don't know a chord progress. Okay, well, you're screwed then. Like you're left behind. I can't sit here and explain everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. And actually I was literally thinking about doing um, a little series on um, uh, like production for songwriters and music theory for songwriters, because you don't need to know everything. You don't need to know right. crazy jazz harmony and jazz theory. I don't even know all that stuff, but you're at a disadvantage if you don't know those things, because if it's like you, you can do it without knowing any music theory for sure, but it's going to take you longer. Like, when I sit down at the piano, I know what like 10 pop chord progressions are. So it, because I know that I can just like play around. I know what chords are most often used in pop songs. So it like cuts off half my piano of options, right? If you don't know that, you're going to be spending all this time just guessing and checking, playing chords and being like, nope, not that. Nope, not that. Nope, not that. Nope, not that. And it's going to make your um, songwriting experience less pleasant and take you like twice as long. And what I will say is you don't have to be an expert at theory. And if you don't know theory, you just have to learn a few things um, and you can do it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not rocket science. It's not hard. I think people are a little scared of theory sometimes. Um, and they, 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 you know, immediately think of like jazz and like all this complicated stuff, but there are some really simple basic stuff that, that you'll pick up quickly that are just going to make, um, a huge difference in your songwriting ability. Oh, no question about it. I mean, for me, like I've only been playing piano for, I think three years. Like I just, I've been learning piano for about three years and I essentially started with music theory. Actually, I told my mm -hmm. teacher, you know, I mean, I was, you know, I started, I was an adult. Sometimes people start, they're like little kids. So I don't think they get to choose what they learn. I think it's like, cause they're children. I'm, I was like an adult and like I was paying for my own lessons. So I told my teacher, mm -hmm. my teacher's hella cool too. And he's like a younger dude. He's in his thirties. So I told him straight up, I was like, look, this is what I do. Like I'm a rapper, like produce my own music. Like I really want to know how to compose my own songs. Mm -hmm. So can we like, can we like push the learning how to read music thing late till later? Cause I want to learn how to like get on the piano and freestyle and know things. He's like, sure, just do whatever you want. Like, you know, and that's kind of how I spent the first two year, year two years learning. So um, and I'm grateful for that now because now I'm at the point where I'm like, all right, now I want to get to a point where I'm like kind of there already where I can be in the shower singing a random thing and be like, oh, I got to go to the piano. And I literally do that now where I can sing something from thin air and then find like one note and be like, all right, that's like a D sharp, yes. a major minor, like now, you know, and like, to me, I'm like, oh my God, like that's that, you know, for people, I'm kind of saying this to you and the listeners. You got to understand that like, yes, music theory sounds like a scary ass word, but I want you to imagine being able to write lyrics without needing a beat. Like imagine the power that you have where you could just start singing anything randomly at any time and then going and making a song out of that. Like that's powerful, right? What's been your experience with that? Like your songwriting process in terms of the production? Absolutely. Part? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and you, you cut out a little bit. So I just want to make oh, sure the question was about production and writing. You know, it's been your experience with like how you come up with songs. Oh, um, yeah. You know, driving in the car is where I get all my ideas for some reason. And yeah. I make a voice memo and they're usually like a two second clip. And I'll be like, Ooh, I like this melody and I, or I want to write a song about this. And that's where it starts. And you just take that and you like play around with it. And if you're playing around with it and it's not working, then go to the next one. Um, I think that like sometimes people feel like they have to like keep working with something or, you know, they had this one idea and they really want to make work that just isn't working and they're scared to, you know, let it go and move on to the next thing. But yeah. I think that it's really important to just get out 
you know, get out of your worry about it being perfect on, on the first go round, you know, think of it when you're writing a song that like you're writing the draft. If you're an artist, you're sketching out where all the pieces are going to go. It's not your finished product. It's not what you're going to be releasing to the world and have everyone, you know, um, listen to it and decide if they like your music or not. Um, if you are scared to create bad music, then you're going to have a really hard time because everyone's first drafts are not good. <laughs> Unless you're like a prodigy, but that's not me for sure. I'm not either. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think like but my whole thing is, oh, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, something that's really important too that I struggled with as a songwriter was I did not know anything about production mm. and I was at a real disadvantage. So if you are a songwriter, I strongly encourage you to learn some basic production. And the reason why is I would write a song and I would have vocals and piano mm. and that's all I would have. And I would send it to a friend and say, make me a produced top 40 song. <laughs> And they would send it back. And although it was great, it wasn't what I wanted. Um, and when I tried to explain why it wasn't what I wanted, I didn't know how. Like, you know, we were talking about the scale like pentatonics. You might know that you, if you don't know the word pentatonics, how do you explain that that's the sound that you're looking for to yeah. someone? Yeah. And the, you miss that communication element. Now, I, I, even, even though, um, you know, as I said, I hope to work with another producer. First of all, the fact that I can produce my demos means that instead of just send a song with vocals and piano when I want a full produced sound, I can send them an idea of how I want the drums. I can send them an idea of the synths I want. I could send them an idea of, you know, some, some of the vocal harmonies because I can actually put them in in my DAW. So I'm giving them a better example of what I want. And then if I get it back, I'm able to more clearly communicate the changes that I want to see on it. So as I said, you know, I'm hiring another producer for my EP because I know that I'm not an expert. I'm not a professional producer. Um, but just like theory, it really, really, really helps to just know some basics. Completely agree with you. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I've preached that for a long time, that if you're an artist or a rapper or whatever, you are you're just at a high disadvantage. Like what you said, you're dis you have, you have a disadvantage if, and that's cool that you brought up the whole idea of communicating. Like that's totally a thing. Like, you know, I, as a producer have worked with artists and we can't communicate. They'll say, Oh, I just want it to sound more vibey. I'm like, I don't know what vibey means at right. all. It's not even like a real word. What do you mean by that? Oh, just like, but I'm like, I still don't understand what you're talking about, you know, and it, and it really right. sucks more for them than me because they're paying me and they've already given me the money and it's a non-refundable deposit. So it's like, that's not my problem that you don't know how to speak music, you know, that's your problem. Uh, and right. also, also the idea of like, you're not going to get the song you want. So it's frustrating for me because I want to deliver at the same time. It's like, well, you're either going to have to accept what I give you or you're going to have to learn how to speak the language because, sorry, just because you started singing doesn't make you an artist. Like, you need to know what's going on here. Do you agree with that? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And I've actually, um, there was a, a, another producer that was giving a talk pre-COVID that I went to in Asbury Park. And he was saying the same exact thing, that sometimes I work with clients and they're like, make it punchier. And he's like, well, like the drums or like, like, and I'm like, no, like, you know, what, what does that mean? It's so difficult um, as an artist, as a songwriter to get what you want if you don't know how to talk to them. So um, it's in your best interest as a songwriter to just learn a few basics and uh, it, it's going to make what you are hearing in your head, something that you can actually translate into the finished product. It's right. going to make that possible. Right. So I, I want to, I want to ask you this too. I, I, I know like part of being an independent up and coming musician is there's a lot of frustration. You put a lot of work into your music, you put a lot of emotion and most of the time you don't get out of it what you wanted. You know, you wanted the song to blow up. You wanted the song to go viral. Really. You want to be making a living. You don't want to work. You want to just make music. So like, 
you know, I know for me and I'm sure other people can agree that it's almost like every song that doesn't get to the expectation you want is like a failure and a frustration, but I'm not, and even me, like I've literally gone through that and I still don't, I don't have the empathy or sympathy for artists because I'm like, you're complaining about these things and you're feeling sad and you're holding yourself back, but you still don't know how to communicate. You still don't know the shit that we're talking about. That's why I don't yeah. feel sorry for people. Cause I'm like, yeah, dude, of course you're fucking, you're not making it. You don't even know what a chord progression is. You don't know what this is. You don't know what, how to communicate for your own music. How can you possibly make it? Can you talk about your experience with other musicians and what that's been like? Yeah. And first of all, I couldn't agree with that more. And I think that a big flaw that I see in some musicians, not all, and I'm talking about musicians that have more experience than me. And I know like, not to sound annoying or whatnot, but I know I'm going to pass them when I do my own music. And um, part of the reason is maybe they have two or three albums, but they've never grown as an Mm. artist. You know, their third album is just as good as their first album. Like, you, you know, are you listening to your music critically? Are you being objective about your song and saying like, does this suck? (laughs) Or instead of like, how can I make this better? How can I make the, the next song I write better than this song? And then how can I make the next song after that better than this song? And how can I make my second album perform twice as good as my first album? And how can I make my third album perform even better? And how can I change my strategy? Because, you know, I posted this song and uh, it got a thousand views on Instagram and faded into the darkness. Um, What marketing are you doing? You know, if you're not getting the results that you want, and I've heard people do this, and especially as a female, I've heard uh, people say, oh, well, you know, you can just post, you know, a cute photo. And I'm like, nope, I can't. (laughs) That's not just it. That's, that's not the strategy. There's so much more to that. And there's so much more that goes into it. But if you want to think that and continue to stay stagnant in your growth, then that is on you. Wait, so people have like suggested that to you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, especially strangers. I got into a argument with someone about that um, kind of recently. But you're not even you know, going to attract the right. Sucks and- right. Well, you're not going to attract the right followers anyway by trying to do any kind of tactics that are just for clout chasing, you know? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Actually, um, someone messaged me and uh, she's a very young songwriter and, and she was asking me all these questions about music marketing. And she's like, what, you know, what, which one of your posts perform the best? And I'm like, photos, but don't, um, you have to be careful with how you're reading into that because people who like photos are not necessarily the people that are going to buy your merch and buy your music and listen to your music. And when I post educational content, I get way less likes and views, but the people that are engaging with it are the people that are actually watching my YouTube channel. So you have to be careful um, and look, look deep into um, the data and, and the results that you're seeing and really understand what's happening. Because at the end of the day, if you have like a million followers on Instagram, but no one's watching your YouTube or no one's listening to your song on Spotify. Like, what is the point? What's the point? So it's so much better to have half that, a quarter of that, a 10th of that, and have, you know, those people actually engage with you and enjoy listening to your music or watching your videos. So make sure that you are creating content that is going to attract the audience that you're looking for. You're speaking my language. I mean, this is stuff that I, I preach this all the time. And I, and I even have really come to find out that the industry, the music industry and the entertainment industry really puts up a lot of facades about like what you should and shouldn't be doing. And there's like a lot of these, like, I don't know the complicated word, but just things that you think you should do. Like you, like a lot of people think that it's super important to start like, oh, the way to start building an audience is like, oh, well, you got to have a lot of Spotify listeners. And although it might be a revenue stream, it's not the, I don't think it's the first way. 
I've even talked to music marketing experts who go, no, that's not the first thing you should do. Like it's something to do, but you should be building a list of people who buy directly from you, not stream your shit on Spotify. Cause to get somebody like, let's say someone buys a CD from you for a hundred dollars or a, a flash drive. That person's probably going to listen to your song on Spotify. Like they're pretty likely to do it if you ask them to, but it's harder to get someone who's just liked a photo and then you go to your likes and you message them like, Hey, I have this CD. Can you buy it? It's like, it's really going to be hard to get someone to go mm -hmm. do that. Right. Um, and so let me, I'm, I'm curious about this. Like what's, you know, what's your perspective on like business for you as an artist and your marketing and your business stuff? Like where do you see yourself with all that? Sure. So, um, have you heard the thousand true fan theory? Yes. Break it down for people though. Cause yeah, I've heard of it. Sure. So basically what the thousand true fan theory is, is that if you have a thousand true diehard fans, you will be um, very successful. And the reason why is if you have a thousand true fans that spend a hundred dollars a year on your product, you're making six figures, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. And that is a very comfortable, um, you know, place to be in as a musician. I'm sure many musicians would be thrilled to be making a hundred thousand dollars. So, um, you know, be careful when you are trying to just grow your Instagram followers for the sake of growing it, because those people are not your true fans. They're right. not the people that are going to spend a hundred dollars on your, um, music and your merch, uh, and other products throughout the year. And, you know, that includes ticket sales. So people might not be dropping $100 right at once, but maybe they'll come to two shows for $20 each, uh, buy a $20 album and a $20, you know, t-shirt from you, you know, bam, there's, there's a true fan, someone that's coming to your shows and, and, you know, bringing their friends to see you and whatnot. So I always keep that in mind, keeping that true fan goal in mind when I'm doing my marketing, um, and, and my strategy. And so what I will say is that a marketing strategy is one um, that should continually be adapted to um, the needs, or not the needs, but like it should be adapted to exactly where you are. Your strategy as someone that has 50 followers on Instagram is going to be very different than someone that has 50,000 followers on Instagram. And maybe your strategy, if you have a smaller Instagram, is to respond to every single comment, um, to engage with the community as much as possible and make sure that you're spending a lot of time commenting on other people's stuff, liking other people's stuff, um, supporting them, sharing their stories so that when you post something that they'll be more inclined to share yours. So that's very different because if you have a hundred thousand followers, you can't respond to every single comment. Um, you know, it's just not possible or you can't, you know, engage with every single one of them all the time. Um, so you might have to change your, your strategy up. So the first thing I would say is, you know, it needs to be adaptable and you really need to be conscious about what your end goal is and how you're going to get there. And I've heard you say this in one of your podcasts, but like, Instagram is not the, the platform to go viral on. That's your networking platform. That's your like LinkedIn platform yeah. <laughs> um, for musicians. So if you're like, I have great music and I want it to be shared and I want it to go viral. If you think that you're just going to post three or four times a week on your Instagram and you're going to blow up, like, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> what TikTok content are you, are you doing? How are you repurposing your song in like a million different ways, making like a ton of different TikTok videos and, and reach your target audience. Um, and then of course, the ones that really connect with you on TikTok will come back to your Instagram <laughs> and follow you there and, you know, get some more of the behind the scenes um, and, you know, information about your upcoming shows and stuff like that. So the strategy is a big one. This is a big undertaking. And, um, not to be rambling too much, but not something good. that I see is a really missed opportunity for artists is I see them promoting their EP or album after it drops. And I'm just like, no, what have you like? Oh, what a missed opportunity. You should have been spending like six months teasing it and uh, giving everyone clips and, um, you know, giving singles early and marketing each single one of those. Um, and instead you just dropped an album and then that's like it. Like I just, my heart breaks for those musicians because I know how much time and energy they spent in, into it. And they just, 
it's great, but if they didn't market it the right way, they're not going to be able to reach their 1,000 true fans. You know, there are 1,000 true fans are out there waiting, and they just, you know, your music didn't find them yet. So um, right. marketing is so important. And uh, if you're someone that struggles with it, find resources, find people to help you um, because there's a million of them out there, but know that it is a really, really critical and crucial part of, of your music. Yeah, hundred percent. I would say uh, that was great, by the way, that wasn't a ramble at all. Like that was all true <laughs> shit. Like that was great. I, I think too, like, you know, my, <clears throat> my thoughts on, on that is like something that really helped me a lot was like when I like looked outside of the music industry for like learning marketing like in like 2018, I started to get like really obsessed with just like digital marketing and like all these things like with, and I just love, I like really like business. Like I love, like, I just love business, talking business with people outside of music. It's kind of weird. It's like fun for me. Uh, and like, I'm a marketing person. I like that shit. And so I learned that like, maybe it's the same thing with songwriting. You know, it's like, you don't need to find a system that someone else did to copy. You just kind of need to like, find as much as you can learn as much as you can and kind of almost like figure out your own strategy in a way that works for you. That's really going to be effective. Absolutely. And, and to your point, um, you know, you can study other people and see what they're doing and, and use that for ideas. But at the end of the day, like your music is unique. It's unique to you and, and your yes. thousand true fans are going to be really different than another artist's thousand true fans. And you're going to have to market to them in a different way. And so, um, again, going to the part about being critical of not only your own music, but your strategy is if you're not getting the results you want, it doesn't mean because you're a bad musician. It's probably because you're not reaching the thousand fans that are out there waiting for the opportunity to hear your music. They're not hearing it. Um, right. So, you know, you got to keep, uh, playing with your strategy until you until you really find what works for you it's so funny and we'll, we can kind of round it off on this note but like you're talking about the number 1000 you know and it kind of just makes me look at it and go wow you know one thing that has helped me a lot is just like mathematically calculating my dreams you know like if I'm like yeah, I want a million dollars it's like well what's the numbers behind like what do you mean you know like if you're just like, All right, I want a million dollars, it's probably going to be easier to do that if you're selling a $1,000 product than it is to sell a $10 product. You know, I sell a lot of $10 products to make a million, but like the thousand, for example, like, okay, or a hundred thousand. Really what's also helpful with that is like, if you're calculating like something that I just think people don't understand is like taxes, like, well, how much taxes do you pay on that? Like, what did you actually have to do? to get to a hundred thousand dollars in revenue. Cause you might've had to spend money to get right. that revenue. So there's like a lot more to it than, you know, I think it's good. Like for me, for this year, 2021, my first year goals are like, yeah, I want to get a thousand true fans. That's a hundred thousand revenue, but I'm not looking at it as like, I'm going to make a hundred thousand. I'm just like, let me get those fans. Cause then in like the next year, when I sell my next album, maybe I can sell that album without spending money on marketing. And then it's like, you know, higher profit, same revenue, but higher profit. You know what I mean by that? So, um, you know, I think, can you relate that same concept to like songwriting? Like what's that like in terms of like the formula, the formulaic part of it? Yeah. So I will say I um, am completely with you on formula crunch the numbers. And I literally look at the numbers every single morning when I wake up, it's the first thing I do. And um, you know, the thousand for the thousand is a good um, starting point, but it will be different for each individual because to your point um, that might not necessarily mean that your take home revenue is a hundred thousand, you know, maybe you don't, you don't think people, maybe you don't think your true fans are going to spend a hundred dollars, especially in COVID, you know, um, people aren't buying concert tickets. Maybe you think your true fans will spend $50. Well, then you need 2000 of them, but maybe you want to make $200,000. That means you need 4,000 of them. Um, you know, or maybe you're releasing, releasing a course and your course costs $300. Well, then you don't need a thousand true fans. Um, you can have less. And so you can continue to play with those numbers um, to set your goals and your targets. So uh, the, the 1,000 is really like a guideline and, and a place to start thinking of. Um, but yeah, I actually, I literally have like an upside chart 
to find my true fans. And I have like my Instagram followers is the top, like almost like a funnel type where I have my Instagram followers at the top. Then I have the people that like the number of people that like my content, then the number of people that comment on my content, and then the number of people that are, are sharing my content. And so I can watch those grow to get a little bit of a better idea of what my true fan number is, because you can have 20,000 followers on Instagram, but if only two people are commenting on your stuff, you're probably farther away from the thousand true fans as someone that has 5,000 followers, but gets like 500 comments on every single thing that they post. That person's yeah. probably closer to being able to make more money with their music. Right. hundred percent. I love that you look at the stuff form like a formula. I mean, it's, you got to do that. You know, you got to know, you know, like for example, if you want to get in better shape, for example, I don't know mm -hmm. like if you feel like you're overweight, like I, for a while was like overweight. Like I felt like I was like, huh, like I would look in the mirror to like, see where I'm at, you know? And I'd be like, Oh, I don't like what I see in the mirror. And then I was like, all right, like that prompted me to like change my body. So like, you want to change your bank account. Like, why wouldn't you look at your bank account every day on the internet? Why wouldn't you like sign in to whatever and look, or like same thing with what you're saying, your Instagram following, do you want to grow on Instagram? Well, like you should probably like pay attention and like not over obsess about it and like beat yourself up and think you're a shitty artist. If you're not growing on Instagram, like you don't have to think that, but just like look at it objectively, like no emotions, like, all right, here's the numbers, mm -hmm. here's all the grown, blah, 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 right? A hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's not, a, you don't need to obsess over it, but um, if you don't, if you don't understand your audience and you don't understand what's happening, you're going to be at a disadvantage uh, to, to really growing it. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, I, I would love to round it off and end it there because I think we've given people so much amount of value. I kind of said it at the beginning, but where is the best place for people to find you? So I am most active on my Instagram, which is Dano Lady Be Good. So you can find me there. Um, definitely, I would love if you could check out Rule Your Sound on YouTube. Um, if you just search Rule Your Sound on YouTube, you'll find it. And uh, would love to hear your thoughts and feedback on the channel. And I hope that the videos are helpful to you just as they've been helpful to me. Guys, I would argue that Rule Your Sound is one of the best places to learn about songwriting and, and song structure and arrangement and just get those tips and you know we're kind of at a good opportunity because we're going to be able to get to see rule your sound grow because at the time of filming this you know we're at 125 subscribers and we're going to watch it grow to a million subscribers you know one day like a lot of subscribers you know and and uh you know dano i, I wish you all the best of luck um obviously i would love to keep in touch with you thank you so much for all the tips that you gave today, like you even put me on to soundbetter.com. Like that's, I'm just, I'm like blown away and I can't even believe I didn't use this more. And I'm like super pumped to like get on this and start using this myself. Um, so thank you. Thank you for your time today too. And have a happy holidays, Merry Christmas and ho ho hope we keep in touch. Thank you so much too. Um, I'm so excited to be a part of this. It was such a pleasure uh, speaking with you today and uh, yeah, definitely keep in touch and happy new year. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks.